Hey everybody, this is the Intro to Real Estate 101 course and I am thrilled to have you here with me today. Let me just tell you, this is a picture of me about 20 pounds ago, about a year ago, okay? But my name is Whitney Nosley. I'm the broker for Whitney Buys Houses. I'm a real estate investor. I'm a real estate genius. I'm a real estate badass. I am all about real estate all the time and that's what we're here about to talk about tonight or today. So what I want you to know is that real estate is not as complicated as you think it is. It's not as complicated as you want to make it. So stop it. Stop trying to make real estate hard. It's not. Also, stop telling me that you want to go to real estate school to get your license. If you're looking at this page right now, you're going to learn everything that you need to know from real estate school and you're not going to have to pay me a couple thousand dollars in fees and fines and dues and licenses and insurance and everything to learn this information. I'm just going to give it to you. Okay? So, how many feet are in a mile? Say it with me, class. 5,280 feet are in a mile. And how many square feet are in an acre? 43,560. That's right. There are 43,560 square feet in an acre. Congratulations. The rest of real estate school is used to teach you how to stay out of jail. How to be ethical. How to protect yourself in the paperwork so that the buyer or seller that you're working so hard for doesn't come back and sue you. <laughs> That's what you learn in regular real estate school. So, let's continue on with what we actually need to know to be a successful real estate investor because we do not need real estate school to be a successful real estate investor. All right, this is my pyramid, and I got to let you know right here and right now that real estate is a pyramid scheme. Everything in real estate, whether you have a license or not, it's all built on the pyramid. And this is my genius description or display of how the pyramid works in real estate. So the first level of our pyramid is agricultural, okay? Agricultural land is what everything started as in America. When the Indians were settling it, there wasn't any residential lots, there wasn't any developers, there wasn't any commercial builders. It was all agricultural. When you're driving down the highway and it's pretty countryside on the left and on the right, that's agricultural land, okay? Anywhere that they're growing something that we're going to eat, whether it's a cow's pasture or a cornfield, that's agricultural land. Agricultural land is really cool because it usually has the least amount of taxes. And if you can get your agricultural land zoned for a greenway, you're going to pay like almost nothing in taxes. That also means you can't rent it, you can't change it, you can't alter it, you basically can't do anything with it, but you don't pay any taxes. So it's a toss up as to what you want to do. Agricultural land is where everything start, starts and that's why it's on the bottom of the pyramid. Next is residential land. And residential land is where the houses are built. Your subdivision is on residential land. Your um, your neighborhood, your grouping of houses, any anywhere people gonna are gonna live is gonna be zoned residential, okay? And for most of the countryside, a lot of the land is residential. If you have a farm and you're saying, well, Whitney, is it agriculture or is it residential? I don't know. I can't answer that. We have to look up the zoning, okay? But for the sake of this pyramid, agricultural land can be turned into residential land. In fact, as we go up the pyramid, you can always go up a level, but you usually don't come back down a level once you've gone up. Okay, so residential land will probably not be turned back into agricultural land. One reason is because there's more taxes on residential land and the county gets used to collecting more taxes and they don't want it to be agricultural anymore. 
And also because usually when somebody builds a house on it, they put a septic tank in, they put the sewer lines in, and it's just not really good for agricultural land anymore. Agricultural land is usually bought and sold in large chunks, maybe 5, 10, 50 acre tracks at a time, whereas residential land can be sold, you know, by a quarter acre. It can be sold by 150 feet by 50 feet. Residential land is where you're going to build houses. It's where you're going to live. It's where you're going to get your Christmas cards. It's where you're going to get baby invitations. Residential land is what you're going to see a single family house built on. But while I'm talking about residential, let's talk just for a second about duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes. And most people are familiar with a duplex, okay? That's one house divided in two with two different addresses, two different mailboxes, two different electrical panels, two different cable bills, okay? That's a duplex. A triplex is the same thing, but it's three different mailboxes. It's three different electrical units. It's three different heat and air units. It's three different cable bills. And a quadplex, you guessed it, that's four different people living under one roof, all divided into their own individual apartments, basically. But once you hit five, once you hit five units, you're bumped into commercial real estate. And this is where it really starts to get fun. So commercial real estate is going to be McDonald's. It's going to be a shopping center. It's going to be where people are conducting business on a regular basis. Car lots are probably commercial, uh, commercial use. Um, McDonald's, Walgreens, Walmart, all, anywhere where you're going to go shopping. Even, you know, a Reap the Sew boutique is probably going to be on commercial. A veterinarian, veterinarian's office is going to be commercial land. Your church, believe it or not, is on commercial land, okay? So commercial land is all around us as well. And these different layers of the pyramid are really important when you start to decide what kind of real estate investor do you want to be. Do you want to invest in land and then get it rezoned for residential so that a developer will buy it and either turn it into a subdivision or a shopping center? Do you want to just buy commercial buildings? Do you want to buy apartments? Do you want to buy trailer parks? Or do you want to buy houses? Do you want to stay in residential, single family residential units? It doesn't matter to me, but you need to know out of these four divisions, and we'll get to four here in just a second, what you want to be, what kind of real estate investor you want to be. So commercial is going to be, when we talk about apartments, it's five units or more or it's anywhere where commercial business is being performed on a daily basis. And I gave you several examples of those. We'll look at some pictures here in just a second of some more examples. Um, like I said, though, once you're in residential zoning and you get bumped up to commercial zoning, you usually don't come back down to residential. But while we're talking about this, I also want to let you know that even within these different layers of this pyramid, starting at that bottom line on residential and on commercial, you could say this is residential one would be the bottom, okay? And then up towards the top of the residential space, let me see if I can get my mouse to cooperate, up towards here, that would be residential four. All right, and residential one down here at the bottom, this is probably gonna be, you know, maybe where the zoning rules come through and they say that you can only have one house per acre. But up here at the top, you can have four houses per acre in this subdivision. And in commercial, it's gonna be commercial one down here at this level, and then commercial two, commercial three, commercial four up here at the top. Commercial one spaces are going to be, you know, some lower traffic shopping centers. You know, maybe a gas station out in the middle of nowhere. Maybe, you know, just a little mom pa shop. But up towards the top, that's probably going to be 
a high density neighborhood. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of foot traffic. There's a lot of car traffic. There's a lot going on in commercial four. And I know that if you're in commercial two, maybe you can have, you know, a 25 car lot. But if you're in commercial four, you can have one of those big, huge car lots with 500 cars. And that's all going to depend on your county. But please know that when you're looking at this pyramid, there's also little divisions within the pyramid. Let's go on to industrial land. And y'all, industrial land is the very tip top of the pyramid because it is the tip top place that you want to be in real estate. We put it at the top because there's not as much of it. It's usually more expensive. but if there's not as much of it and there's still a demand for it and it costs more money, guess what? We get to charge more money for rent. Because industrial land, this is gonna be your manufacturing centers. This is gonna be warehouses. This is gonna be landfills. This is gonna be outside storage. This is gonna be, you know, kind of the ugly nitty gritty stuff that makes America run, but that we don't really want in our subdivisions. We want it over on the east side of town or the south side of town or the north side of town or, you know, we want it kind of tucked away. We still want all the revenue that the industrial land brings in. We still want all the jobs that the industrial land brings in, but we don't necessarily want to look at it. Y'all, I love industrial land, and I'll show you a picture here in just a second of a piece of industrial land that I bought kind of on accident, and I'll get into that story in just a second. So just hang out with me for a second. So just to review, the bottom of the pyramid is agricultural. Everything started agricultural. Everything is always going to start agricultural, and then, you know, somebody, mom and pa die off, grandma dies off, and she's got this 100-acre farm. Well, somebody comes through, a flipper comes through, and they buy her 100-acre farm for, you know, $1,000 an acre, so they buy it for $100,000, right? Well, then they go through the trouble of getting it rezoned for residential, and now they can sell each acre for $50,000. So now we got 100 acres for sale for $50,000. That's a lot more money, isn't it? Okay, but instead of selling the whole 100 acres for $50,000, we're going to keep the front 20 acres that border the highway. We're going to make that commercial so we can sell those lots for $500,000 an acre. So the front of Grandma's old farm is now... Walgreens and McDonald's and a bank and a bunch of other stuff and then you drive on through and maybe there's some apartments maybe there's some condos maybe there's some houses tucked in the back beautiful but all of those changes had to go through the zoning commission it doesn't just happen because you wanted it to happen, okay? And there was some money involved, some architect drawings, some engineers, some surveyors. There was a lot of money spent to get it rezoned as residential, and then there was even more money spent to get it zoned as commercial. Probably didn't turn Grandma's old farm into a landfill, but maybe we did. I don't know. All right, so if you have any questions about this pyramid, you are welcome to send me an email, info at WhitneyNicely.com. But hang out with me for just a second. Let's see if I can explain it a little bit more and give you some pictures and examples. Okay, again, agricultural land is green belts. They pay lower taxes. It's farming. This is where livestock lives. You could grow trees. You could have a Christmas tree farm or just a pine tree farm. You could grow sod. I mean, there's all sorts of different things. You could grow soybeans. You could grow cotton. You could grow goats. I mean, you could grow anything, and that would be the way that you were bringing in revenue on this land. It's agricultural land, y'all. It's farming. And here's a picture of some agricultural land. I took this. This is a four-lane highway. And these are some goats out cleaning up the kudzu. You see all the trees there covered in kudzu? This is agricultural land. They're not using it for anything except to grow trees and grass. And this guy 
hired these goats to come in and clean up his agricultural land. If I'd taken a picture on my side of the highway, I was stopped when I took this picture. Don't worry, mom, I was stopped. But if I'd taken a picture on the other side, you'd see the corn growing. Okay, this is agricultural land. This is what it looks like all across East Tennessee, all across most of America, as far as I'm concerned. The good parts of America have the hills anyway. Right, y'all? <laughs> okay, and now we're talking about residential. So we're going to the second layer of our pyramid, and we've got houses. We've got subdivisions. subdivisions. We've got duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes in here. You know, maybe we have a piece of land, and there's one mobile home on it and five acres, that's residential land. You know, residential is pretty much wherever somebody is living and receiving their mail, receiving their uh, Amazon Prime boxes, that's gonna be residential. And if you're living in like a high rise condo, that is technically commercial because of the density, because of the amount of people that live on one acre. Don't get too in depth on it, guys. This is the intro class, okay? Residential, regular houses, subdivisions, you know, like you see on all the sitcoms. This is actually a picture of my triplex in Morristown, Tennessee, okay? You can see there's one unit right here. They're three bedroom, one bath. I rent them for $550 a month. This is the second one. Three bedroom, one bath. I rent it for $550 a month. And this is the third one, okay? They're all connected. There's one wall and one wall that connect all of these. They have separate driveways. They have separate mailboxes. They have separate utility bills. Most of the time, if you see a triplex, it's gonna have just one roof going straight across. My triplex is a little bit of a stair step, but it's still just one place. Now, commercial real estate is what really gets me excited. Well, I can't say that. I love real estate. I love your real estate. I love my real estate. I love their real estate. But commercial is when you start to really get into the money. Okay? So, apartment units with five or more, that's commercial real estate. A mobile home park is commercial. McDonald's, shopping centers, you know, Kroger, Publix, uh, Bilo, all of those places, a Walmart shopping center, all those places where you're going to bebop in and buy something or you're going to leave your dry cleaning or you're going to go to the um, accountant's office or you're going to the attorney's office. I mean, wherever they are regularly conducting business, that's commercial. Churches are zoned commercial. Churches have to be built to commercial code. Seems kind of strange, but if you only fit into one of these four categories, you don't grow stuff at the church. Well, I don't think you do. You don't live at the church, and you don't manufacture stuff. Well, I guess you could preach that you manufacture good people at church, but that's a side tangent. Has to go into commercial. This is my five unit apartment complex. And let me tell you that we bought this for about 125,000. And what's cool about commercial real estate versus residential real estate is I can buy a house in this neighborhood for 125,000. And then I'll have one person paying. If they don't pay, I'm SOL. But this is five units. See, you can see five mailboxes right there. It's one, two, three, four, and this whole thing over here, this is the fifth unit, okay? Five people are chipping in. That means if one person doesn't pay, four other people are gonna pay me. It's a beautiful situation. You pay down your notes so much faster. You make so much more money. I love my small apartment units because I can buy them for the same price as I can a house and the money comes in five times or 10 times faster. I love it. Okay. To get up a level on the pyramid, you have to go through a use on review. Now your county may call it something different, but they're basically going to say that the use of this property is on review at the public office. 
Y'all let me know if you got any problems with this change in the way this land is coded. Uh, industrial examples are, you know, for outside storage. A lot of those um, metal storage containers, they're just sitting around, they're on industrial land. Warehouses, you know, places where they build stuff, that's on uh, industrial land. Landfills are industrial land. Recycling centers are industrial land. I mean, heavy duty truck shops are industrial land. Uh, where they recycle tires, that has to be industrial land. I mean, it's really like the nitty gritty, dirty kind of stuff that most real estate investors never think about. But my mom is a special case. My mama is an amazing real estate investor because she owns a landfill and that is it right behind me. Not exactly what you were thinking a landfill was going to look like, is it? It's kind of pretty, isn't it? This is a construction landfill. There's not any regular daily trash in this landfill. There's not anything, you know, combustible. There's not anything terrible. It doesn't even really smell bad because it doesn't have diapers and decaying food in it. This landfill is for flippers. When you demo a house and you gotta haul the stuff to the landfill, you don't take it to the regular landfill, you take it to the construction landfill. And that's what my mama owns. She's a smart cookie. All right, so here's some different ways that you can buy real estate. And most people know that cash is king. Well, I'm telling you that cash is not king in real estate because it can take a whole lot of time to get that cash back. And if you don't know what you're doing, you can lose all that cash real fast. And I don't want you to do that. So let's look at some other ways that you can buy real estate. We can have a VA loan, but if you didn't serve in the military or you weren't uh, discharged with honors, then you can't have a VA loan. Most people think they can just go get an FHA loan, which includes Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but only 18% of the population can actually just go get a loan because you have to have money, you have to have a job, you have to have a um, credit score, you have to be really good looking on paper to go get an FHA loan. And once you go get too many FHA loans, the bank, the government, somebody decides that they can't give you any more. So that's when you start going to the conventional bank loans and you go to the small town banks, you go to the small credit unions, you go to local people and you say, hey, I need to go borrow some money. I want to buy some real estate. Again, though, you have to have good credit. You have to have a job. You have to have all this stuff. <sighs> and it's just a lot of work. So what I learned how to do, because I forked over all my money and the banks didn't believe in me. They saw I had good credit, they saw I had a good job, but they saw that I'd spent all my money on real estate, so they wouldn't give me any loans. So I figured out and I became the queen of owner financing and lease options because those take no money down, they take no credit, and they take no banks. Nobody's gonna tell you that you've spent too much money on real estate and they can't give you any more loans if you're doing owner financing and lease options. Nobody's going to tell you that your credit is bad and not give you an owner finance or a lease option. Owner finance and lease options are so amazing. And because only 18% of the population can go get a regular loan, that means the rest of us need to be going after these owner financing and lease option deals. Except there's only like 2% of us that do. And those 2% of us that do go after the owner financing lease option deals, we're tomorrow's millionaires. If you got any questions on that, let me know. I'll be glad to talk to you more about lease options and owner financing. But let's just continue on some other ways that you can buy real estate. You can put an option down on a piece of property, which basically says that you're going to put some money up front that you can buy the property for a certain amount of money anytime in the next X amount of years. And you basically forfeit that option fee that you put up if you don't buy it. 
But what you do is, let's say that you're going to buy a piece of property for $100,000 and your person will take $5,000 as an option fee. Then you've got it wrapped up and what you're wanting is for the market to go up. You're wanting all the neighbors on every side of you to start selling to big commercial deals and getting two or 300 for their lot and you can enact your option and sell it for 200,000 you put up 5,000 to start with but you made 100,000 well you actually made 95,000 and that's how an option works your seller needed that 5,000 for whatever reason up front you waited you enacted your option you made a lot of money you are a genius I don't do many options because I don't like putting that money up front. I'd much rather do a lease option or an owner finance so that I can make some money on it monthly. But options are pretty fun too. Lastly, you can use a private money partner. And this is somebody that has a lot of money or they got equity in their house or, you know, they're just looking for a good way to make some money with their money. And they don't want to go through the hassle of actually buying houses. They just want their money to work for them. Private money partners are awesome to have in your back pocket and to use their money when you're buying and flipping houses. Much better on the short term than the bank, especially if the bank says you're already over leveraged. Ooh, okay, so here's some ways to find real estate. And when I work with you in my program, this is the intro program, this is the quick start, this is not the whole kit and caboodle. These are just some different ways that I have of finding off-market properties. I don't want you to waste your time calling expired listings, and I don't want you to waste your time with a real estate license hunting through the MLS to try to find a good deal. The good deals, the quote-unquote good deals, aren't on the MLS. They're the silent sleepers all around you. And that's what I'm going to teach you how to do. All these different ways, I've got videos and scripts and formulas and worksheets so that you can work through each one of these topics to get a really fat check. Okay, and then let's talk about exit strategies. Since this is the intro course, one thing I want you to know is that an exit strategy is just what it sounds like. How are you going to get rid of this property? I mean, it's really nice that you're going out and you're hunting and you're pecking and you're making offers and you're trying to make deals happen, but what are you going to do with it when you get it? Are you going to buy and hold it so you're going to keep it forever and ever? Amen. My mom is like that. She thinks sell is a bad four-letter S word. Okay, she's going to rent that puppy for the rest of her life and it just keeps cash flowing and giving her money from now and now from now until forever. I don't really like regular rentals. I like those lease options because you get a big lease option fee. Maybe you get 10,000 down before somebody moves in. I've had people give me $40,000 to move into one of my houses and then move out seven months later. Can you believe that? Because it happens, but it won't happen on a regular rental. That's only going to happen with a lease option. Now, you could owner finance these deals back out, but I teach my students that we always buy as many deals as we can with owner financing, but we never, ever, ever sell with owner financing. And one reason is a guy named Dodd-Frank, or two guys named Dodd-Frank, and that's basically a government regulation that says, I can't sell more than three houses on owner financing in a year, but I don't really want to owner finance these houses back out. I want to buy houses with owner financing, but I don't want to sell them with owner financing. I want to give these people a lease option on a short term to get them to buy this house. If worse comes to worse, you could list the house with an agent to sell it fast, but the fastest way, the most efficient way, the almost guaranteed way that your house is going to sell on a certain day and time is to auction it. And I am a licensed auctioneer in Tennessee and I do real estate auctions. I love auctions. You don't have to be licensed. You don't have to have any kind of real fancy experience to go to auctions and buy properties. You certainly don't have to have an experience to sell your property at auction. And it's a really fast solution for people who need that quick fix or top dollar because there's nothing like an auction to bring more money to the table. People like the activity. They like the, the action at the auction. 
Now, if we're talking about agricultural land, then you could develop it or you could sell it to a developer who is going to turn it into a subdivision or a commercial strip center or something. And you could get a, a fee for doing that. You could fix and flip it. You could do a lipstick on a pig kind of flip, or you could go in like the TV shows do, and you could gut the whole kitchen and spend $50,000. I don't suggest you do a flip until you've done several lipstick on a pig kind of flips. And I wrote an ebook on how you could do a lipstick on a pig kind of flip, but it's basically going in and maybe changing the kitchen knobs. Maybe you paint one wall. Maybe you freshen up the landscaping out front but you just do one thing that makes this place look more appealing you know if you bought a house and it was built in 1962 and grandma and grandpa lived there and then they died and it was never ever ever updated it probably needs at least a little bit of a lipstick on a pig to get this thing to sell in today's market for top dollar uh, you could also trade real estate you could trade up you could trade down you could do a 1031 which is a IRS a uh, definition for how you can trade up and using using the 1031 exchange, you don't pay taxes on the trade up value, but that's a whole long story. This is the intro class, guys. Again, if you have any questions on the exit strategy or how to buy or what you want to do, you're welcome to send me an email at info at whitneynosley.com. Oh, and there it is. So... I hope you've enjoyed the first video. There's three videos in this series, and I hope you've enjoyed the first one. Again, if you want to, you can follow me on Instagram at Whitney Buys Houses. I'm very active on Facebook under my name, Whitney Nicely, or under my Facebook page, Whitney Buys Houses. Uh, you can find more information about my courses, about my programs, about other specials or any kind of deals I have going on on WhitneyNicely.com, but you can always email me info at WhitneyNicely.com and I'll be glad to answer your questions or get you on a strategy call so that we can find out what you need to do to become an awesome real estate rock star and get started with that residual income today.